going on, guys? It is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and this, of course, is the Bolo Show. Want to know what the Bolo Show is? That is the Be on the Lookout show. We're talking about all the hottest new comic book day releases that came out yesterday. This is pre-recorded. We record this Wednesday nights, but we're covering those first appearances, variant buzz, reader buzz books, as well as Jack's long-term play. Now, if you watched our three up, three down, covering those hot and cold comic market trends, we made a little announcement there last night, but we're going to make it here as well. For the foreseeable future, this is the last Bolo Show episode as you know it, but we have something that's going to be in its place, right, Jack? That's right, Brian. Unfortunately, uh, due to the decision made by uh, Diamond Comic Distributors to no longer be distributing new comics to comic shops uh, nationwide, which is really unfortunate for the health of our LCSs. But um, nonetheless, because of that decision, obviously there won't be any new comics coming to stores starting next week. Um, so the, it will be very difficult to do a bolo list surrounding new comic book day. But um, we know how important content is for all of you right now. And the comic game does not stop. So the bolo list will continue. It will transition to a back issue bolo list. It will release at the same time that you've come to expect it weekly. Um, and it will highlight some back issues to be on the lookout for while you're doing your online searches, buying on eBay, checking out different Instagram and YouTube sales. Um, and then we will have the show where we will discuss these these back issues yeah i also want to take the time to make sure if you guys are looking for content there's a lot of publishers are doing some stuff out there that they're getting digital comics in the hands of readers so if you want to read books check out like mad cave studio offers every first issue for free at madcavestudios.com uh forward slash downloads i believe uh, a lot of the indie publishers are doing stuff. I believe Vault always has something going on. Uh, Source Point Press has been doing stuff. And then, of course, one that we're big on here at this channel, Boom Studios is doing a lot of stuff, not just for readers, but especially to help comic book stores out during this time of need. So make sure you check out um, all their social, all their websites, and there's a bunch of stuff going on. We're trying to share it as much as we can. Yeah. And make sure you follow some man's comics on Twitter as well as AKA Mr. Bolo. And we're also on Instagram and Facebook as well. But with that being said, let's get into this show. We're going to start with those first appearances. And here we have it. It's a very short first appearance list this week for us on the Bolo list. And we're talking Hellions number one with Jack's favorite. As always, we got a new team, right? Right. A new team and a new X team. So this is, you know, this to me goes in line with Marauders and uh, Fallen Angels and all these other kind of X properties. Um, it, it's just a coupling of characters that don't have anything going on. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of people excited for this book. You know, it's kind of a, um, a unique cast of characters. There was some hype surrounding the like mystery reveals of the characters. They used like the blacked out images and they kind of one by one revealed them. Um, so there was some marketing that went into this one, but um, other than the team appearance, nothing really to write home about uh it had some kind of like medium level reader buzz uh on a week where say there wasn't the strongest marvel offering i would have thought maybe it would have had more buzz but um also i want to note that i'm actually surprised i thought we were going to get more comments on the list about the first appearance section being that i only listed one book because there were several others where there was unconfirmed information at the time of release, it was really tough this week to get confirmed information being with the most shops being physically closed to the public. Um, and that disseminating information is a little slower right now as everybody focuses on, you know, things that are way more important and businesses are just struggling to stay in business right now. So um, shout out to all the LCSs who came up with creative systems today, whether it's pictures on the window and people selecting them like a drive through menu or whatever um, store length stores went to today to uh, get new comic books out. Yeah. I didn't even get to make it near my comic book store. Work was brutal. Spent the whole day on like five different conference calls, but <laughs> either way, that's the first appearance section for this week. And we're going to roll now into the reader buzz. And good thing the reader bus section is longer than the first appearance, but we're going to start with Transformers versus Terminator number one. This had a bunch of great covers. Also, our show sponsor, Slabbed Heroes, has that great exclusive up on his site. 
and check out frankiescomics.com as well. But Terminator and Transformers mashing up. What we got, Jack? This is another great crossover um, from IDW. They're, I mean, these crossovers are doing absolute numbers in the secondary market. Uh, and the reality is while they get kind of laughed at by a certain population of the community, there's another population of the community that just finds them fun and exciting. And that's what really they're intended to be. It's not, um, you know, there's, there's first appearances and things like that that come into some of these titles. But the reality is that they, it's just a, a logical mashup of two properties that would never interact in a normal um setting but in this sort of a setting seem to work so perfectly and with that in no case is that more prevalent to me than transformers and terminator when this kind of cover art imaging for cover a was originally solicited uh we saw a lot of social media buzz i mean a lot the reaction was resoundingly positive and i think that's why you see so many uh, store exclusive variants, which has negatively impacted the immediate sale of the um, of the incentive variants. The one in ten is currently trading for about eight dollars, and the one in twenty five is trading for about fifteen. So you're looking below ratio uh, for both. With shipping, you know, if you wanted to buy both, I've seen them go for in like the thirties. Uh, they there was one listing recently, I think that sold for like forty. But um, I think this is going to be one that's going to dry up over time. And this IDW Dark Horse uh, collaboration, it, these variants are going to have value. It just This is what happens every time you see the type of numbers of store incentive or store exclusive variants that we see. Because, again, all these stores that are doing exclusives, they're, they're ordering 1,000 copies. And then they're getting the subsequent variant covers. So, you know, you start looking at, like, 41 and 25 variants you know that's that's a lot for a very few number of places to put out onto the market but um, but that's also is if you're wanting one of those incentive variants especially the one in 25 it should be easier to get what you're seeing like you said is running below ratio because there's actually a lot of them to go around Right, yeah, I tagged Brian you in a uh, Instagram post. Joel's R Collectibles, a uh, store exclusive manufacturer who does a lot of like Boom Studio stuff. Um, started doing some IDW stuff. They've got a bundle deal for twenty dollars shipped for the one twenty five and the and the one ten. I mean, you can't beat that. Yeah. Then the next one we're talking about for Reader Buzz is Immortal Hulk number thirty three. Now we talked about this on the last call show. We like that Bennett variant, but. We didn't like this just because it's a Mortal Hulk number 33, right? This is one of those monumental yeah. issues. Yeah, they messed up the, the legacy numbering. Um, it's, it's on the cover. It's, uh, it's part of, say, the marketing of the book. But it, 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 and that's why the Bennett cover is, is the homage the way that it is. Um, and that's why they put a little extra into the, the variants that you see for this book. But this is the 750th issue of Hulk, whether we're talking Incredible, Immortal, or just Hulk, the legacy numbering, I, I was so down with that system in the beginning, um, but it just has not been followed through. And, and so here's an example of an issue where we should be celebrating the 750th. I've also argued, imagine if every LCS you went into, the legacy numbering was made to be such a big deal that when you went into the back issue bins, they were actually ordered by legacy numbering. So you, you were actually looking at, instead of having Hulk over here, Immortal Hulk over here, um, you ha and Incredible Hulk in a separate section, you actually had them together in the, the legacy numbering. I think that stores would see increased sales, and I think that's how they could possibly bring back the run collector who has dropped off because there's constant rebooting if the they runs were are shorter, <laughs> right? If they, if they were made to feel that even though those runs are shorter individually, they make up a larger run. And we really re looked at the way we are looking at this numbering. Um, I feel like the legacy numbering had so much potential and has been quite possibly the most botched major program that a comic book company has, um, endeavored upon in the last few years in my opinion and that includes whether you want to look at new 52 or anything else 
I think it would be cool also with to go with the legacy numbering is no matter like what are those – you talked about Hulk being multiple titles, right, but total 750. If across those titles or across those, if you wanted to add that run collector niche to it, put like a three-page story at the end of each book that goes together to make one bigger story or multiple story, you know, sequential. So you got whatever that new title is, but then at the end – Mm-hmm. legacy numbering and then there's also a three-page story that kind of adds up that builds a, a greater story over all the issues but i think in the future going forward you'll see more stuff like that to tie together the when there's like breaks in title for a character um it's a little tougher to do for the ones going back like in the in the mid 2000s um but you know what else would be good brian we talked about this a lot is retail practices um they had these great like instagram graphics when they first did the legacy numbering that broke down all of the series that went into each character's legacy numbering stores should have that whether it's poster form or uh, adverts yeah club flyer style um they should have those in the stores so that customers have that information at their fingertips that's just these are little things that would help stores sell back issues which of course now has become an extremely important part of the business and something I hope publishers learn because we've talked about that before is publishers do not support the back issue market because they don't directly profit from it. But I wish they would see the importance of the back issue market on the overall health of the comics industry. Staying with Hulk, but going back over to Incredible Hulk, we get that facsimile edition of number 182. I think this is going to be the lowest numbered of the three, 180, 181, 182. But it's so my, great for sets. That's my thought. This is a set building book right here because 180, 181, 182, if you were to ask me the best way to sell those, that it would be as a set of three rather than 180 or 181 individually, which both individually perform pretty well. I think 180 is like an eight dollar book, 181 is like a ten dollar book. Uh, so they they do pretty well. But I could see 182 bringing you a premium and being that like difference maker in one listing versus another because I I don't see too many stores stocking get all three slabbed. Right, right, and I don't see a lot of stores stocking 182 on the shelf, Brian. I mean, it just there it's really a filler for that that collector who's looking to put that three issue run together. It's not a collector who's buying it for the first appearance. I get why 180 was done. Uh, 182 is a little different. Um, it's maybe the least significant facsimile ever done, but because of that and because of the way that 180 through 182 is often collected together, I really think it's a solid long-term play. And the next one we're talking about is Rick and Morty number 60. This is one of those books that has that cult fan following, man. Yeah, we were just talking about this book on issue number 50 with the monumental issue, and they put a little extra jazz into the variants. We haven't talked about it in several months. We're talking about it this week because this is reportedly the final issue of the Taylor series. Um, and, you know, that's always going to get some attention because I think sometimes fans don't appreciate things till they're gone. So now you're starting to see the Rick and Morty fans come out. Bring them out, bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. Disappointed. Now, I would not be surprised to see them continue this comic in some other, another volume, maybe, a re, you know, give it, a, give it a little while and reboot. They do mini series surrounding a lot of the, the various characters from the show. I, I'll, I think that could continue. But the Rick and Morty comics, I mean, let's be honest, Omni Press, what else do they really have going? But that's another thing you never know. Um, and I, I, this is no factual information. This is just me conjecturing. But this is also what happens when a property wants to switch a licensor. So if, say, Rick and Morty wanted to go to IDW, felt like they could sell more books on IDW, and the next one is one of Jack's big faves, and a lot of Valiant fans like this. We're talking about Exo Man of War number one. This goes along with the lines where Valiant was saying they're going to have, what, new, new number ones every month? New number one every month. Obviously, that's going to be impacted by this whole uh, um, health situation that's going to be slowed down uh, to an extent. It's unfortunate because they were really gearing up a big 2020. And then with the events of the Bloodshot movie trying to piggyback off that, but then that movie not really even getting a full run in theaters. Um, 
frustrating year, I would say, probably for the Valiant crew. But nonetheless, their books that they're putting out this year are being extremely well received by the Valiant community, which is the key, right? Because first off, when you've got like a small community you cater to, they tend to be diehard but picky. So you want to first make sure that you're satisfying your core base and then you want to expand out. And if you're satisfying your core base, it's going to be a lot easier to expand out. And, you know, whether it's the visitor or um, bloodshot or um, Dr. Tomorrow, there's been just a number of releases this year that Valiant's put out that have been very well received. And uh, Exo Man of War is one of the flagship um properties this is a character who crossed over in the video game world with uh marvel's own iron man there was a uh a, an old uh playstation game uh exo man of war versus uh iron man back when acclaim owned valiant comics but uh you know so you're, you did this is think medieval space iron man um so very very cool character um it, again, if you're a Marvel Comics fan, if you're a superhero fan, this this is one of those titles that's like right up your uh, up your alley. This is a very easy transition for a regular Marvel Comics reader to step into and read this book. Um, it it's got a big two feel. Uh, some Valiant books have a very indie feel. Some have a big two feel. This one has a very big two feel. So, you know, if you're a superhero guy, um, you know, and you're looking to expand into other universes. This is a great opportunity, um, Exo Man of War number one in stores. And again, because of some of the situation we've got going on, you know, we're gonna have a delay probably before we see issue two. So make sure you, you know, you've got time, uh, grab issue number one. I think a lot of these uh, new series that start these new number ones, it's gonna be real interesting to see what they can do with the reader buzz momentum because we've seen before that like when people stop talking about a book, their interest rate, it's gonna be very hard if in two months shops open back up and suddenly we're we're trying to push number twos. Yeah, there's a lot of people, Superman's Comics family, uh, people on the channel watching these videos commenting that they would have wanted to see an Exo Man of War movie over a Bloodshot movie. And see, here's the thing. I think an Exo Man of War movie would be amazing. A Bloodshot movie cost 40 something million dollars, which is why to all those people out there who are going to hate on Valiant, they need to realize that even with everything going on, um, when you have a $40 million budget, the movie doesn't look as bad as you would think it would if it was say like birds of prey um which had a much bad example but that that had a much higher budget uh it's it's a that's it's a perfect example for this scenario because he's talking about <laughs> yeah. a, a movie with a much higher um a much higher budget that was got stuck, that warner brothers money right it was stuck with similar um timing as far as release and a similar like buzz level uh but Exo Manowar, any Exo Manowar movie would be incredibly expensive. Yeah, and then the next one we're going to move over to right now is that issue number two of Star Wars Bounty Hunters. This has been a great s series. Yeah, we're only two issues in, but I really enjoyed the first issue. And I'm a big fan of Lee Bermejo, but holy crap, I like that Phil Noto incentive variant on this one for sure. Yeah, Noto incentive is crazy. Um, a lot of people talking about new Bounty Hunters in this book. Uh, yes, there are, It's but it's one of those things where it's like, it, we don't know if this is a significant first appearance or not. Um, this could just be tied to this book. Uh, and we didn't have concrete information before the list. So it wasn't something that I felt like I, you know, wanted to steer you to. There were already other places reporting it. So it was one of those things where it was kind of, let it be what it is. And there's enough heat in this book anyway, right? It's got solid reader buzz, variant buzz, a lot of cover art collectors paying attention to it. Star Wars books are trending upward consistently. Uh, and I don't think that's something that's going to change. That That is a trend people need to pay attention to. Uh, I think that reasonably with three up, three down, with the market slowing, we may start really hammering home some of the things that are happening week in and week out. Like, I mean, I could put Star Wars on the list three or four weeks in a row because but it, the reality is 
it were kind of funny. A property as old as that as Star Wars is, it never had the comic following that allowed it to be a consistent winner. Hence, why Dark Horse had the 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 uh, license for so long. And now, finally we're starting to see the respect on the market. When you and I did a back issue Bolo video on Star Wars, we talked about how it doesn't make sense that a lot of these first appearances really are not being collected. And now we're starting to see maybe not some of the older ones or the ones from a few years ago, like Kylo Ren, which I still feel like is criminally underpriced, but we're starting to see some of the new ones that pop up and some of the new series, whether it's Kylo Ren's origin story, whether it's this bounty hunter series have like significant heat upon release. That is a good sign. Moving on to the last book on the reader buzz this week, we got mighty more from power Rangers number 49. This is like that. I don't want to say penultimate issue, right? But this is leading right. up to that big number 50 that we've been talking about on this channel for the past few months. And this is not a small issue in its own right. So that's right, Brian. We're, we're, this is right before we are getting to the ending of the Necessary Evil storyline. Um, major, major reader buzz from those who have been following um, this Necessary Evil story. This is obviously a big issue as we now we have the return of the Ranger Slayer front and center. Ranger Slayer is going to be so much about of what we're talking about when it comes to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers going forward. You know, the action figure reveal at Toy Fair, um, the one shot coming out, the free comic book day issue whenever we can get. I, I got to believe free comic book day is probably going to get postponed or canceled. But I got to push it back. Yeah, I got to believe we're going to. We're gonna have it, you know. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, so we're just, we're just kind of pushing the whole schedule for the comics year back a bit. But um, and then probably the end of the year will end up bleeding into twenty twenty one. But you know, Ranger Slayer is a character that they have major, major plans for. And when you create Draken, um, there was kind of like a need to have that that counterbalance. I think Ranger Slayer is perfect. If you know her history, you know, coming up, say, under Draken to then going against um, it, and being an alternate version of, of Kimberly Hart, who's already a popular character. That's the Pink Ranger. Um, this, was, this was highly anticipated from a reader buzz perspective. Now, aside from that, for those of you collecting those Goni Montez foil variants, this was the ever popular Green Ranger foil variant. So this is gonna be one I think to pay attention to because with the release week being what it is and the distribution being being what it is, this may be a book that ends up being really in short supply, Brian, because I know a lot of people are putting those sets together, but this is also the by far most popular character in the Power Rangers um, universe. So having- yeah, Not to mention if 50 gets held up, yeah. Nine gets a lot more time to marinate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I definitely think we're going to see a, a significant delay before we get issue 50, um, you know, and something to pay attention to as we move into issue 50 is those Dan Mora uh, secret story variants, which we, we talked about when those first started, those get ignored, like the Scott Koblish um, Deadpool variants, it, you know, and I get why, like they're not aesthetically pleasing. You're looking at an interior page for a cover. It doesn't, it doesn't do a lot just on first glance. The unique thing about what's going on though with the Power Rangers and Arun Singh talked about it on his interview here um, when we did our original Creator Spotlight interview with him. He talked about the fact that these are telling an original story which is not gonna be reprinted. So for you die, die, die hard Power Ranger fans, um, and I know there's some of you out there, like I don't know if you guys fully are aware that this exists and what is possibly gonna happen with that 50th variant. All I'm gonna say is be on the lookout for that Dan Moore, Dan Mora um, Power Rangers 50 variant whenever that is able to uh, be ordered. Uh, it's one to pay attention to. Right, and if you're looking for Ranger Slayer books, we did do a video on this channel for Ranger Slayer back issues to be on the lookout for. We'll put a card up here right now, as well as a link to that in the description if you're interested. But that's wrapping up Reader Buzz. Now it's time to move over to that Variant Buzz. Then King us off this week on the Variant Buzz section, we have Jenica number two. This is that one in 10 Lauren Walsh variant. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. 
I actually really like this cover. Yeah, so this one, um, this one sort of took me a second to decide, like, do I love this or hate this? And then, yeah, I, I really, really like this cover. It's, it's different. Um, I like. I gotta be honest with you. I like the trade dress, the whole color scheme of the of the Jenica books. I think that it adds a lot. Um, I think it's an important element. I think this this mini series has been extremely well done. I think it's been slept on a bit. Um, but extremely well done. The uh, Jenica incentive is currently selling for about ratio, really about ten dollars. Um, I think that's due to the fact that we still saw some stores do some exclusives for number two. I think stores have realized that it doesn't need to be a number one with Jenica. The Jenica is, is a consistent seller, which is again why I just don't understand why we didn't get any Jenica toys at Toy Fair. I think Nickelodeon is missing out with that. They missed the boat on on a quick strike opportunity there. But yeah, I I think. This one I like. I think it's unique. I think it's going to have staying power. You know, I'm a long term believer in the long term hold value of Power Ranger and G.I. Joe and Transformers and Turtles variants. This is one to me that screams of down the road spiking in value. Yeah, I want to say one thing about this book and a lot of the books, especially in the variant bus section this week, you can see the impact of what's been going on because I saw a lot of online retailers. When you normally look this late, they'd be add to your wish list or sorry, sold out. But a lot of them are actually still available. Yeah. The next one we're going to talk about is that star number three, one in 25 Raza variant. And star continues to be popular, continues to um, have a following. Um, I think I think we've had buzz Brian on, on all three of the first three issues from this series. So um you know that that's impressive in and of itself. Um, Raza is a popular cover artist. Raza is always going to get a level of attention, but y- you don't get every cover popping the way that this one seemed to get a lot of attention. And I think that you know Raza is an artist where we talk about this on the channel sometimes, where like there's that potential where any cover could potentially get really hot. But this is another one I think is affected. These, these incentives, I think, are going to be infected more than anything because, it's again, most of us are putting our orders in at comic shops from the door. It's tough to, like, look at variants, especially higher-priced variants, look at the uh, condition and be able to shop. I think a lot of these are going to end up on eBay. It's going to depress the values of a lot of incentives. Um, but there's going to be some great buying opportunities because there's some great variants this week. Yeah, just like the next one, that Judge Dredd. What is it? Final witness number one. There's a one in 10 John Boy Myers. Yeah. False witness number one. Uh, John Boy Myers, one in 10. Great cover. Um, it is currently selling for about 12 to 15. So slightly over ratio, but readily available. I would also say that this is a five issue mini series. John Boy Myers is going to do the one in 10 variants for all of them. They make a character um, kind of profile set i would say be on the lookout for issue number three you heard it here right now i'm the first one who's going to tell you it. you're looking at a female judge dread cover that is gonna kill but either yeah, way i wouldn't even until i saw the list at first i was like oh i didn't know there was a new judge dread series and then i didn't also didn't know john Bo myers was doing the variant on it yeah yep yep and and you know the fact that we're getting uh variants from a a judge dread series is cool and then that's again that's part of also the the uh benefit of judge dread coming over and getting you know idw come kind of getting in the idw system and and getting the variants the idw way um i think that that's gonna add a lot of value to the brand i think that there's a lot of meat left on the bone with judge dread i think there's a lot of potential there with that character just talk about a new movie franchise um possibly again getting a reboot and every time that they've come out of judge dread has been popular for the time the carl urban movie was popular obviously the sylvester stallone movie was killer when we were younger so you know the, the judge new, dread yeah, the new movie was great i was hoping for a sequel yeah judge dread is a character I, i'm real bullish on i think judge dread would work really well in like a netflix series and um, the first issue of judge dread you can find for cheap yeah and well all the the first issue of Judge Dread you can find for cheap. Um, a lot of people are not aware of like Judge, uh, what's it, Judge Dead or Judge Dread, the um, 
the character who completely they stole Batman Who Laughs from. I mean, ba- I mean, Batman Who Laughs looks like a total ripoff. That first appearance is a UK issue. It's an absolute ghost. Uh, just difficult to find. Not crazy expensive, but difficult to find. And I think in a modern Judge Dredd, having, having um, Judge Dead be the villain would be, I think that would be popular. I think that would be incredible. Yeah. And once we're done recording this, I'm going to judge bed. <laughs> but you do, you mentioned John Boy Myers. John Boy Myers, one, uh, I'm a big fan of his art. I still, to this day, like my favorite covers of his right now has been um, when he was doing the Teen Titans. Yep. But moving on into the variant buzz. We have Wolverine number two, the one in 25 incentive David Finch variant. I don't know, maybe I was living under a rock, but I didn't hear a lot of attention for this. And this is actually a really gorgeous cover, especially when it comes to David Finch. Maybe if you were throwing Moon Knight in the background, people would have been talking about it, but it's still a great cover. I just... Yeah, this this got talked about a lot late, but this is, again, I think a victim of the week. It, yeah. it just, um, I think this book had potential to be a high dollar variant had it not been for the given week. But, you know, shout out to Simpleman's Comics family member, Carter Lee, who posted on Instagram. He bought several copies of this, and uh, he loaded up on that uh, Gerald, uh, Gerard, what is it, Peril variant, the uh, Spider-Woman variant, which is another great-looking variant, seems to have a, a, a high level of popularity. The next one we're talk about is Suicide Squad number four, the cover B for this, right? Yeah, and a lot of people like this. This was my sleeper pick. I was almost bummed that people started to pick up paying attention to this. Um, Iron Man cover. Yeah, Key Collector listed it on uh, on their uh, like a uh, list of books that they highlight for the week, which means, of course, um, uh, rumor has it paid attention to it because that's you know that's how they get their list. But you know, it this was one of those books where. Uh, I don't think people know the backstory. Like Jeremy Roberts did the 2015 Suicide Squad uh, covers. And, you know, so if you think back to when they had like Joker's Daughter and Suicide Squad, that was a red hot run. Those covers were great. And he really has not done a comic book cover since then. So you're looking at like three, four years without a comic book cover. So people aren't necessarily familiar with him, but his art style is extremely realistic. This has a very movie poster feel. It, you, you mentioned Iron Man. That's because you get the look of Deadshot the way he's supposed to look. Um, I really... Yeah, I mean, it looked like Iron Man movie poster. Yeah, I really like this cover. I think this cover has a chance at some staying power. I can't foresee it getting ordered crazy heavy because Jeremy Roberts isn't a name that naturally invokes a retailer to say, oh, this is going to drive people to buy it. Um. And it depends on when that cover art image was like available to retailers. Was it like a before? I think it was definitely before FOC because we covered it on the last call show. Okay. But uh, um, I don't know if that's enough to get DC cover B uh, B's ordered at retail anymore. All right. And then the next one we're talking about. There's another one when I first saw on the list. I was like, "What the f is he talking about?" But then I saw the cover. I was like, "Oh, okay." We're talking about that Red Sonya. Vampirella, Betty, Veronica, number 10, that cover B. This was another great cover. I Once I saw it, I was like, all right, I can see why this is on there. Yeah, this is, an, it, to me, this is an incredible variant. Um, it, 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 it comes from Dynamite Comics. This is, the, again, another crossover. So we're getting the Archie and Dynamite crossover. Robert Hack? Yeah, Red, yes, Red Sonia uh, meets Betty and Veronica. Um, there's also a really cool 1 in 30 uh, virgin incentive that I think was very, very, very much slept on. That's going for um, half ratio. This book is available. This book is sold out at most retail. It is available at like eBay for cover price, which makes me think there are probably some more copies maybe sitting back at Diamond. Obviously, um, Diamond is going to be difficult. You can order in stock product from Diamond. Comic shops can still order that for the time being. Um, how much in stock product a comic shop is going to go by, I don't know. But if this cover, if you're looking at it on the screen, Robert Hack, Robert Hack does these kind of like vintage variant looking covers extremely well. You got Spicy Especially Space. For Archie. Yeah. You get Sabrina the, and stuff like that. So here you get a golden age. It says Spicy Space Stories. It gives you that kind of mystery in space feel. I like the um, grocery store sticker 
for the uh, price on there. Um, the nostalgia feel is very cool. Be careful submitting it to CVCS. I know that they uh, one time graded a book similar to this and <laughs> yeah, actually the stuff was real. Yeah, they <laughs> they marked off for the uh, for the um, damage, which is funny because they had to be not paying attention to the book, but. Uh, um, I don't think they would have that problem again. So that's probably just, we're just being facetious there, but yeah, this is don't sleep on these types of releases because Robert hack books can get popular in the secondary market. I know our buddy, uh, Dino from tales of the flip side. He's a big Robert hack collector. Yeah, he was trying to collect all of them. Yeah. I don't know if you knew exactly how large that library was. when he started trying Yeah. To rubber hack covers. But, um, the good thing is, like, they were talking, him and Robert Hack were talking back and forth on Instagram over him, too. So that was a great thing. But uh, the next book we're going to talk about is Batman number 90. This is the second print, if you want to call it variant. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that Batman number 90 is doing so well on the secondary market. Um, at first, we attributed it to Punchline. People thinking Punchline was going to show up and then not. Um, and I do think that was the original reason people kind of veered towards that book since then the reader buzz for the series has been extremely strong so 90s sitting at like a 20 dollars book that's the whenever you have that happen you got to have a second print so um for those readers who may have grabbed 89 and then they just did it for the punchline or they you know they did it for the flip um maybe they they flipped their 90 here's an opportunity um to get a reader copy for the collection um i don't foresee this thing going up in value because it's a pure reader buzz book. But um, nonetheless, one to keep an eye out for because it's one that people may have overlooked this week. And I know a lot of people for a lot of different reasons probably could pick this up um, to make sure that they have it in their Batman runs. So there it is, guys. There is the first appearances, the reader buzz, the variant buzz. Now, last week we had kept asking you guys to comment throughout the video. Then we also said we we're going to pick one of those comments and we had a giveaway to announce, right, Jack? That's right. We've got some great books to give away um, from some partners we've worked with. We asked you guys to make some comments. We were really just looking for some feedback. A few different um, questions we threw out during the episode that we were looking for some feedback for. We got some great feedback. Um, we put those comments in the old random.org uh, generator. Went ahead and drew uh, one at random. And the winner today is John Leone in his comment. Really love those AWA Upshot books. I picked up all of them and several of the resistance. So John is going hard on the resistance. And uh, John, you won this great CBSI comic book invest.com, the heist variant, Wolven Heart variant. Brian and I had a hand in the production of those two. And this great Frankie's Comics, Francesco Mattina, Joker variant. Nobody hotter in comics right now than Joker. So, John, go ahead and email simplementscomics at gmail.com. Give us your shipping information. We'll be sure to get those books right out to you. So, yes, congratulations to John. But the one last thing we have to talk about on the Bolo Show tonight is Jack's long-term play. So here we are, end of the show. As always, we've got Jack's long-term play. And his long-term play this week is that Ghostbusters year one, number three, one in 10 variant. We've talked about these before. A lot of people, I don't know if they're a Ghostbuster fan or if they're not, but these one in 10, each one of them is also front and center, one of the characters from Ghostbusters, right? But this one's a little different. Yeah, this one's different. So like I've already been paying attention to these Ghostbusters year one books because I think that they're going to be incredibly low printed. And I think Ghostbusters is getting ready to be extremely hot with the new Ghostbusters movie. Now, unfortunately, we were supposed to be getting that this summer. Who knows if we will? We may still. But either way, Ghostbusters is about to have a renaissance. But that's not even why I like this book. To be honest with you, I like this book for Batman reasons. Because as you, know, you can, Adam's reasons. Right. As you can see, this is a Batman 251 um, homage. It is a Neil Adams homage. And it, coming from a property like Ghostbusters, I really like the ghost in the shape of the Batman trade dress. And this is a book that I've known about for a while. And to be honest with you, I kind of kept under wraps. I, I, as soon as I saw this book, I said to myself, and I hope by now, all of you out there who have been watching me do these long-term plays for over a year 
have learned a little bit about what I see when I come to these kind of variants. I saw this book and I immediately said to myself, oh, this is the easy moneymaker. Easiest moneymaker of the week for me. And simply because it plays to multiple categories. So it checks off that box. When I say multiple categories, Batman fans and Ghostbusters fans. Um, and as well as homage collectors. There's people that just love homages. For every person in the comment section who's going to talk shit and say, oh, it's derivative and that's what that's just the easiest thing to do. Well, you know what? There's a reason why people keep doing them because they're extremely popular, um, both on the first market and the secondary market. But yet, yet we're in the third issue of a four-issue miniseries that's essentially a series of one-shots. For that reason, and the fact that we're coming out this week of all weeks, um, I knew this book wasn't going to be heavily ordered. And sure enough, you do not see this book available. There's currently one available on eBay. I watched the pricing of this book all the way up until release date. When it got first put up, just like every IDW book, the very first stores that put it up, they essentially didn't know what they had. So they put it up for about $10 and it sold almost immediately as, as soon as kind of cover art imaging came out. Then it got put up for $15 and it sold out. And then the last pre-sales went out for about $25 plus $5 shipping. So $30. Then the book came out. Now the book is in hand and the prices drop and it started to go for about 15 to 20. And then it creeped up to about 25 and then the copies dried up. And now the only copy left on eBay is at 35 plus $5 shipping. And I have zero doubt that that copy is going to sell. And then the next person who lists it should list it for higher than that 40 because supply and demand that is just, while the demand may be smaller, the supply is non-existent, and this is a great opportunity with an IDW play to kind of name your price. Now, there should be some, I guess, coming in from maybe Midtown, but even on a book like this, guys, this is a book Midtown probably only got three copies of. So we're not talking about a large number of copies hitting the market. This is a book that's going to be grabbed up in PCs. This is my long-term play of the week, and we're talking about a book that's four times ratio this week. I did not expect it to be that high, but I did expect it to be at least two, two and a half times ratio at this point. And also, I hope you guys pay attention to the fact that it's very rare that I talk about incentives in this position. This is normally reserved for cover price books that are just being ignored and that have a chance long term. Books like Outlawed, number one, that we covered a couple weeks ago. But this, this is a one in 10 incentive, I think, to keep an eye out for. This is one of those weird IDW books I could see two, three years from now, Brian, when you start looking at variants where you're like, this goes for $200? I cannot believe this goes for so much. But when you start looking at what some of the past homages for IDW, when you start looking at books with similar print runs, it can get incredible. And the cover art imaging alone for this, Peter Venkman front and center, um, it makes this one incredibly, incredibly desirable. I love the homage. I love that long-term pick. Um, it, and there's Ghostbusters fans out there. It's just, it seems like, I never understand it because I'm a, I'm a big Ghostbusters fan because obviously it's 80s movie. But it's just weird. Like, I figured, although there's Ghostbusters fans out there, they're not as vocal about the comics. And I don't see it, but I think it's one of those things that, like you, your whole point of your long-term play is letting it sit in a box and people are going to go back and look for it later. Um, I just, with the new movie coming out and everything, there's going to be resurgence. Whenever it does come out, I just wish that, I think being selfish, that there was more Ghostbusters fans out there for comics. Because some of those comics are really good. Star, Star Wars, like Transformers crossover that just came out. Yeah, but. yes. Star Wars makes me hopeful. What we were talking about with Star Wars, because there wasn't too long ago that Star Wars... I, we all got that same feeling. Like yeah. people love Star Wars, obviously on a whole nother level. And yet the comic fandom isn't there. And now we're starting to see it. So, the, you know, I'm hopeful that that will come around. Um, you know, Ninja Turtles is a little more synonymous with comics. Um, you know, but I'm, ho I'm, always, I'm hopeful that some of these properties that have been ignored in the past will come around, come around. Now, when the new Ghostbusters movie did get announced, that real Ghostbusters number one, that first appearance of the Ghostbusters, did pop a little bit. Um, so there's that potential there, right? You see that spark, but you're right. It, it, it's, it's a big it variable to, to kind of 
yeah, it hasn't been able to sustain. There hasn't been able to be an, uh, I mean, IDW doesn't have an ongoing series yeah. for, for Ghostbusters. I do think they're going to have one coming. I think that that's what these like year one books are going to lead up to. I think there'll be an ongoing, um, I'm hopeful there'll be an ongoing um, from IDW. I'd like to see it. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and give IDW the challenge to like uh, up the ante on it, maybe make it a little more adult than um, the last couple series that have been put out. Give it kind of that Power Rangers feel. Well, look what Power Rangers has done to reinvigorate adult Power Ranger fans. I think Ghostbusters could do the same with a really a gritty horror series that horror is hot right now, and, and Ghostbusters is made for that. You're saying you want a Cullen Bunn Ghostbusters series? I would love a Cullen Bunn Ghostbusters series. <laughs> but either way. I'll take so Chipsidarchy. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be a good one too. Yeah. Uh, or Tim Seeley. Mm-hmm. So there's Jack's long-term play, and there, of course, is the Bolo list. Like we said, going next week, we will go on to back-issue Bolo show, and for the time being, until comics start coming out again, we get those new releases. So we're going to have that in the place, so make sure you tune into that. Also, with the last call show, we're going to have something similar. We haven't quite come up with the content for that yet. We're still thinking about it, but we will have another show in its place as well, since we can't really do FOC when nothing's coming out of the out of the distributor so do us a favor comment down below let, me, let us know what you guys thought of the bolo list let us know what books you guys picked up there's some books out there that could have made the list that weren't on the list um let us know what you guys thoughts were with that being said this is jackie brown with superman's comics we'll see you guys in the next video